Let's turn now in our Bibles to James chapter 5. Tonight we want to look at verse 9. James 5, 9. Here James commands, Grudge not one against another. In the 11th verse of the previous chapter, 4.11, we find James saying, speak not evil one of another. So uh, two things. One, don't speak evil of another. And here we're not to grudge one against another. And then he adds, brethren, your brothers. Don't speak evil. Don't grudge. The word grudge can also be translated complain. Don't complain one against another. Interesting to look through and see what the scripture has to say about the subject of grudging. We find God commanded in Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18, thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am Jehovah. So you're not to bear any grudge against the children of God's people, thy people. Psalm 59, 15. Let them wander up and down for meat and grudge if they be not satisfied. David is, is really praying God's um, judgment upon his enemies. Let them wander up and down searching for meat and then grudge if they be not satisfied. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, as he's talking to the Corinthians about their giving, he said that their giving should never be grudgingly. And then finally, in 1 Peter 4, 4, 9, he says, using hospitality one to another without grudging. <laughs> I can remember when we were pastoring in Tucson. This Air Force sergeant invited my wife and I over to his house for dinner. He also invited a young fellow from the church that was also stationed there, Davis Motham. And um, this young fellow in the Air Force and myself were hearty eaters. <laughs> and they had pot roast, and it was very good. And so they offered us seconds, and we took them. And then the fellow says, usually when we buy a pot roast, it lasts us all week, but it looks like this one's not going to, you know. <laughs> well, Peter said, if you show hospitality to one another, don't grudge. <laughs> you know, don't do it grudgingly. And when you give to God, don't do it grudgingly. Uh, the word grudge as a synonym could be complain. Don't complain one against another or uh, every man according as he is purposed in his heart so let him give, not complaining. Not complaining about what you have given to God and if you are showing hospitality, not complaining. To the Galatians, Paul warned against biting and devouring one another, grudging against each other as brothers. He said, if you bite and devour one another, then you'll be consumed by one another. I see a sad evil in the church today. And 
That is many within the body of Christ, brothers. And, and notice he says, grudge not against one another, brothers. And, and you see brothers in the body of Christ attacking one another, at war with one another within the body. Some of the most vicious attacks against Calvary Chapel do not come from the world outside, but they come from other supposed ministries that I feel are just jealous because of what God is doing here. There's a Mr. Gilliland who claims to be associated with Calvary Chapel here. He even says he attends. Maybe he's here tonight. I don't know. But he's been viciously attacking Calvary Chapel on the web. Um, he claims that we do not have a proper view of the Trinity. And... Um, It's, it's, I don't know what his real complaint is. It's over semantics. And, and uh, yet there on the web, you know, he keeps writing all of these vicious things, vicious attacks, scurrilous things. Now, biblically, if he has a problem... He ought to come to me and sit down and talk it over. But he's never endeavored to do that. He would rather just go to the anonymity of the email and just, you know, publish on email all of his grudges. Though James says we're not to grudge against another. There's a group that call themselves Cure, a fellow by the name of Horton who is involved with that. And they seek to smear Calvary Chapel on the radio. They have a program called Cure, and it seems that we're their favorite targets. And the chief complaint that they seem to have about us is that we don't share their opinion on the uh, extreme five-point Calvinistic doctrine. And anyone who is not a strong five-point Calvinist, according to their interpretation or understanding, isn't really a Christian. I think that it's rather tragic that there are many ministries who seem to feel that their primary calling is to tear down other ministries. There are many excellent cult awareness ministries today, apologetic ministries, and to become involved in an apologetic ministry or the cult awareness ministries takes sharp, brilliant minds. And some of the sharpest, most brilliant men are heads over the several cult and apologetic ministries throughout the United States. But I've noticed in the last three or four years, many of these cult ministries have begun to launch attacks against other cult ministries. There's sort of an infighting that is going on. And these fellows are taking this keen acumen and ability to, you know, analyze and argument and so, so forth, 
And, and they're using this in attacking each other. And, and what a sad thing that is. Because the, the main emphasis of their ministry originally was to expose the errors of the cults. Now it seems it's to tear down the other cult ministries. And uh, there's been some terribly vicious things that have been said and attacks going back and forth among these ministries. And it hurts the body of Christ. Um, I see it as a trick of the enemy, and I'm sure that Satan is just back laughing. It's sort of like when Paul the Apostle was uh, arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin for the trial, and he realized that half of them were Pharisees and half of them were Sadducees, the two cults within the Sanhedrin. Now, the real divisive part between the two cults, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, was over the subject of the resurrection. For the Pharisees were humanists. They were materialist. They were those that taught all you have is the material world. There's no unseen spiritual world at all. That there are no spirits, there are no angels, there is no resurrection. But the Pharisees affirmed the realm of the spirits. They affirmed that angels existed, and they affirmed that there was life after death. There was going to be a resurrection. So Paul, realizing that this group that he is being tried before is divided into these two camps. He said, I believe in the resurrection of the dead, and for this cause I've been brought here to face this trial today. Well, immediately, all of the Pharisees said, well, this is not a bad guy. I mean, after all, the you know, resurrection, and the Sadducees started, you know, getting upset, and they started fighting with each other. And they, they got to fighting with each other so much that they forgot all about Paul. <laughs> now, this is the tragedy of some of these ministries uh, where this infighting is going on. They become so interested in fighting each other, they've forgotten all about the cults. And, and so here's Satan, you know, he's just sort of sat back, pitted them against each other, and just sits back, I'm sure, just smiles and grins as he watches these guys attack each other. And he, he feels left alone. Uh, they've forgotten that he's the real enemy. And that's tragic that we sort of oftentimes lose sight of who the real enemy is. It's not a brother in the body of Christ who may have a differing viewpoint on a particular doctrinal issue. They're not the enemy. When I was over in Hawaii many years ago, I went to uh, the... Uh, long house there in the uh, Hawaiian Hilton Hotel where Dr. J. Vernon McGee was speaking. And he was having one of his Bible tours, you know, through Hawaii, which he took annually. And uh, so he noticed me there in the audience, and so he called me up on the platform, and he said, this young man uh, teaches through the Bible, and God is blessing his work. He says, we don't agree on everything, but uh, 
I respect his right to be wrong. And uh, so, uh, but it was friendly. And it is true, we didn't agree on everything, but we loved each other. And, and we weren't out to fight each other or to try to down each other's ministry because there are points of, of differences as far as our views on the uh, work of the Holy Spirit in the church today. And, and that's the way it should be. It, 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 we shouldn't be at war with uh, another ministry just because uh, they don't uh, practice as we practice or believe exactly as we believe. We're not to grudge against another brother. Writing to the Galatians, Paul said, let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another and envying one another. And yet we see so much provoking, and usually because of envy. How desperately we need to really consider these commands of the scriptures not to grudge or complain against another. And the warning of Paul that if you bite and devour one another, you'll be consumed by each other. The problem is when these attacks are made and these false accusations are being made on the email or on the radio, they almost force you to respond because if you don't respond, then people will assume that what they're saying is correct. And, and this Mr. Gilliland has been saying on the email that I believed and taught crazy stuff that I've never believed and taught. And so it's necessary to get on there and say, this is what I believe. But what a tragedy that you've got to take time out from the work of God to, uh, you know, clarify the position because some guy has made some scurrilous attack against you. So what it does is divert a person from the actual ministry to which God has called us. Uh, to uh, take the time to clarify or to defend uh, so that people don't assume that these ridiculous charges are actually correct. So this passage, grudge not against another brethren, applies to those who are always looking for, and if you look for, finding something to complain about. Have you ever noticed that there are those people who seem to have the gift of complaining? <laughs> I think that they have a basic assumption, nothing is perfect. So whatever may be happening, happening, they feel that it is their duty to find out what's wrong with it. Never, rather than always looking for what's right, they're looking for what's wrong. I received a letter today in which the person said, now I am not judging but Chuck Missler is a false prophet. <laughs> now, what kind of a perverted or inverted thinking process can make the claim, I'm not judging, and then declare Chuck Missler is a false prophet? Isn't that judging? And yet, they, they sort of hide behind, well, I'm not judging. Well, you are. They are judging. They're, 
they're absolutely wrong when they say they're not judging. And then, of course, they said that because we allow Chuck Missler to speak, Calvary Chapel is thus guilty of spreading all over the United States uh, false attacks against our perfect government. Have you ever noticed that complaining people never seem to be happy people? Have you ever seen a happy complainer? <laughs> Nothing seems to satisfy them. They seem to feel miserable about everything and want people to share their misery. How is it, I wonder, that their voices always seem to take on a whining quality? Have you noticed that there's sort of a whine to their voice? I mean, it just becomes a, a part of the characteristic of the whole thing. I was with a group of fellows recently, and a lady came up and began to explode as she expressed her opinion and displeasure over what was happening. I mean, she really went on a tirade. And as she went marching away in anger, one of the guys remarked about her outburst and said, thank God I'm not married to that woman. <laughs> and I said, you should thank God you're not that woman. I said, if you were married to her, at least you could get away for a while when you went to work, but she can't get away from herself. She's got to spend the entire day with herself. No escaping. And I do feel sorry for some people that have to live with themselves. Because they're always angry. There's always something just edgy on, about them, you know. And yet James exhorts us not to grudge against another. Now, what is the danger of this complaining? James said, lest you be condemned. Now, complaints are usually launched as a result of a person's judgment of a situation that they have judged to be wrong, and thus they're complaining about it, or about another person who they feel is wrong, and they're complaining about them. If I start complaining about something that you are doing, the complaint that I am making is an assumption that what you are doing is wrong. I'm judging what you're doing to be wrong, and thus I'm complaining because you're doing it. Thus, complaining has within it the element of judging. So, the warning by James is don't grudge or complain against another. Because you may be judged or condemned. Many of our complaints are directed against God. God interpreted the murmuring of the children of Israel against their circumstances to be murmuring against him. Why? Because he was the one that brought them into those circumstances. And thus, their complaining or murmuring against the circumstances was tantamount to murmuring against God. And so God came down on them 
for murmuring against the Lord. If I'm complaining about my circumstances, then I am complaining against God. Because I do believe that God is in control of the circumstances of my life. I am a firm believer that nothing happens to me that God does not allow to happen to me. And because God has allowed it to happen to me, he has a purpose for it happening. He is intending through this to work out an eternal purpose in my life. So that if I start complaining about my circumstances, God takes that complaint personally as complaining against him because he's in control of the circumstances. How important it is for us to, with the Apostle Paul, learn that whatever state we are in, to therein be content. Content with the circumstances, though they may be adverse circumstances. Knowing that God has a purpose, even for adversity in our lives, as he works out his eternal plan. Paul said, godliness with contentment is great gain. Oh, how much better to be content than to complain. Now, we are told in the Bible that if we start judging each other, what we are actually doing is establishing the measuring stick whereby we will be judged. That's what Jesus said when he said, for in whatever measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. In other words, you are setting the standard for your own judgment. If you are hypercritical, judgmental of everything, and, you know, this super judgmental, then you're going to face a super judgment. The same measure that you're meeting it up. God's going to use that measuring stick when he judges you. How much better to be very merciful and lenient? Say, well, I don't know. It sure looks crazy to me, but he must have a good reason for it, you know, and be merciful and lenient. Then when you face God, he'll be merciful and lenient with you. You establish the standards which one day will be used when you are judged. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So don't complain one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned, lest you set this standard for judgment that you won't be able to measure up to in that day. And then James closes the thought by saying, for the judge standeth before the door. The day is coming when all of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And James says the judge is standing at the door. Now, sometimes the judgment begins in this life. The Bible says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And many times judgment begins in this life. Eliphaz, the friend of Job, said, even as I have observed, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. It's interesting 
how there is that Proverbs, the chickens come home to roost. Or the proverb, what goes around comes around. And so often, those things that we are complaining about in others are the very things that we become guilty of ourselves. So that if I am sowing discord, then I'm going to be reaping discord. If I'm sowing bitterness, I'm going to be reaping bitterness. And, and oftentimes, the reaping process comes before we will stand before the Lord to be judged. But James is not referring to the present retribution that often comes when we are guilty, but he's referring to the future, when we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And as he declares, for the judge is at the door, uh, you have the picture of sitting in the courtroom and the bailiff is there in the front and you've been brought in and you're sitting in that seat of the defendant. The prosecuting attorney comes in and shuffles his briefcase and his papers and the clock is slowly moving around and the session is to begin at nine o'clock. The bailiff has explained the procedures of the court, notified you that the judge will soon be entering and when he enters, everyone stand and, and he goes through the procedures that will be taking place and then when the judge sits, you may be seated and and you're just waiting for the whole thing to start. The judge is at the door. James is saying, don't be a complainer against another, brethren, lest you be condemned, because the judge is at the door. You won't escape that condemnation. Proverbs 131 declares, Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. And so James gives us warning here. Not to be a complainer. Not to complain against another not to complain against God, knowing that you're setting standards that you won't want to be measured by when that day of judgment does come. Father, we pray that you will help us that if there be that tendency in us to always be finding fault, to always be complaining, complaining about what others have done, others have said, complaining about the circumstances at the church, at the job, at home, or whatever. Lord, if that has become sort of the bent of our lives, unbend us. Deliver us, Lord, from that attitude and spirit that is so hurtful to us.
and hurtful to others. Lord, give us an accepting heart, a willingness to accept another, though there may be differences, a willingness, Lord, to accept our circumstances, though they might be very trying and difficult. And Lord, make us a happy people, a joyous people. And may the joy of the Lord and the faith in him cause us to see the victory, the ultimate victory in every situation that you have promised to give to us. And so may we always be rejoicing as victors rather than complaining as though we were losers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.